nanohub.org. Online simulation and more for nanotechnology. Hello, welcome to the system part of the introduction to thermoelectricity. Uh, you learned in the first uh, part uh, uh, through Professor Mark Landstrom fundamentals of uh, what is the thermoelectric effects, what material properties contribute to that. And here what we are going to see is uh, in building an energy conversion system, either for power generation or for cooling, what are the parameters that come in. And the first parameter is really ZT. ZT is not something that come in from a microscopic point of view uh, uh, analysis, only it comes in uh, when we look at a system. Um, you learned in the previous lectures uh, uh, by Professor Landstrom that the three main properties uh, that uh, exist in the case of Seebeck coefficient, Peltier and Thomson can easily describe the real energy conversion that happens when a um, voltage is generated by temperature difference, a heating or cooling is generated by current, and Thomson effect is really a higher order effect that comes um, from the temperature dependence of the Seebeck coefficient. Uh, Kelvin found uh, early on that Peltier coefficient and Seebeck coefficient are directly related and he also found uh, what is the Thomson uh, coefficient. If you look at the fundamentally, um, is only one material parameter that comes in for energy conversion. Um, but when we actually want to generate electricity or we want to generate cooling and heating, we need to consider a, a whole system and that's when uh, material parameters, uh, multiple of them come together. Let's consider the case of a thermoelectric element, this yellow element here, and assume we send the current, is a current going from one side to the other. And depending of course to the P or N type, the one side of it could be Peltier cooling, the other side of it could be Peltier heating. Um, how do we actually, ca actually calculate the total amount of cooling? Um, what we need to solve um, uh, first is a differential equation. This equation at an element x, x plus dx, give you an energy balance, how much heat conduction locally happens, and there is a local generation due to joule heating, and uh, there could be um, a local energy exchange if the Seebeck coefficient changes with distance. But if the material is uniform from one side to the other, um, this term only shows up as a boundary condition. And what we have to do is solve this differential equation with the boundary condition here to be adiabatic, and the other side to, uh, to be constant as a heat sink. And the solution of this differential equation uh, give you this. Uh, the net amount of cooling, Q, is um, given by the Peltier cooling. Uh, this is the Seebeck coefficient's time temperature at the cold side. That's the Peltier coefficient times current. We already knew that. Well, what's interesting is by doing the balance of the joule heating over the whole structure, when the material is uniform, half of the heat goes back to the cold side. That's the famous one-half factor. And then the temperature um, gradient um, need to fight heat conduction and now we have a term due to the heat conduction. This is the equation that gives you the net cooling for a given current and a given temperature difference. We can optimize this uh, for maximum cooling, that's what is called the maximum cooling condition, the uh, optimum I is given here, and based on this, delta T max is ZT cold square divided by 2. That's an important uh, parameter because it tells you that for a thermoelectric um, element for cooling application, independent of geometry, maximum cooling is given just by the Z parameter, that is the famous Seebeck coefficient squared times electrical conductivity divided by thermal conductivity. Uh, this is geometry independent, and at maximum current, half of the cooling power is cancelled by the joule heating. Um, so this uh, simple result um, uh, tell us by optimizing the material, um, we can increase the maximum cooling. The question is, um, the geometry doesn't impact delta T, but geometry does impact Q. So the Q term here uh, is really directly affected by the thickness of the thermoelectric element, and that's something uh, you can look at it by putting the dimensions. Uh, so in the real design, you need to consider the geometry if you are interested to optimize the cooling power. 
But uh, maximum uh, cooling is not the only parameter that is important. Um, one has to consider coefficient of performance. Coefficient of performance is really a way to characterize how good is the refrigerator, amount of cooling, Q divided by W, how much work we need to do. And that's COP, coefficient of performance. And what you see is that uh, the top of it is exactly what we had before. This is the equation for cooling. I wrote it again as a, a function of current. But then on the bottom, we need to put amount of work. Amount of work has two components. One of them is this Peltier effect. And the other component is the Joule effect, I square R. Um, and ratio of the two give you how good is um, efficiency of the thermoelectric model to um, convert electricity to cooling. Here are results for a commercial model versus current. Um, what is the cooling Q? And that's a black line. And then what is the COP, coefficient of performance? And that's the dashed red line. And what you see is that um, the current that gives you the maximum cooling is not the same current that gives you the maximum COP. So um, uh, basically, in a real operation of a thermoelectric uh, refrigerator, we can adjust the current uh, depending on what we want to be. And most uh, applications, your preferred region is in between. You don't want to work at the highest cooling, but have such a poor COP that you're wasting a lot of power. Or you have such a high COP, but the actual cooling is little. So that's the trade-off that usually one has to deal with. Um, the other parameter here is that uh, you may notice this is a real sample. Um, the cooling starts at one amp, uh, not at zero. The only reason is that this is assumed to be a delta T of 20 degrees. That means you need at least one amp to create a delta T of 20 degrees and then on top of it, you have a, a capability to pump heat. So that delta T comes in um, as a shift of this problem. So, um, so that uh, what you see where ZT comes. Another thing that is very common is why we have multi-element thermoelectric models. Uh, often people talk about uh, uh, a P and N leg as a single elements, and then in a real model you have hundreds of these N and P legs electrically in series and thermally in parallel. Um, why uh, we are doing this, in principle, you could do the same amount of cooling with just one element. Um, this N and P doing it in this particular geometry, it only help us because trading off voltage versus operating current. If I have a thermoelectric model that um, has only one element, I may need 100 amps to work with and a voltage of uh, maybe 0 0.1, 0 0.2 volt. That's um, uh, uh, high, the high current is actually a problem. Uh, wires that we have to thermoelectric elements, if you put 100 amps through them, they could melt. And there is a huge amount of resistance losses we do. So instead of that, uh, we make that thermoelectric um, element to be 100 um, NP pairs, and that way the voltage is 100 times more and the current is 100 times less, and that's what uh, help us in practice. Um, this is um, something that caused, of course, issues about the manufacturing because now you have to think about how to put the elements, um, how to position them, how to put the electrical contacts. And when you have hundreds of elements electrically in series, one of the contacts go bad, uh, the whole module fails. Uh, so you need to uh, come up with um, quite robust designs or um, ways to avoid that. So these are some of the challenges, but that, uh, that's a degree of freedom we get by having multi-leg models. We discuss about ZT of a uniform medium. Um, in early work of thermoelectrics, people said, uh, can we do things better if we use inhomogeneous medium? We can have regions uh, with a given Seebeck coefficient, electrical conductivity, thermal conductivity, and here, of course, is a very arbitrary geometry. Just to tell you, nothing um, um, uh, is out of the question. There is a very interesting paper came out in 91, uh, Bergman and Levy, who said that the Z effective of a composite can never exceed the largest value of the Z in any component. So basically, this um, 
uh, work which they showed rigorous proof for two component system and they kind of speculated for multi component system um, is powerful because it says by playing with the geometry and compositions you don't want to improve z effective but what is interesting is um, uh, z does not come in uh, as a uh, fundamental parameter. Z came in when we did the energy balance um, for the, uh, for example, cooling, or we can do the same for power generation. Um, a couple of years ago, um, C. Shibian, um, who was a scientist at UC Santa Cruz, uh, had an interesting idea. And the idea was, well, can we uh, grade the properties of the thermoelectric material to improve the maximum cooling? And uh, his idea was the following. Assume S squared sigma is constant. As you know, this is uh, numerator for Z. And if this is constant, that means Z is constant. So basically, you have an element um, of length L that has a Seebeck coefficient S, electrical conductivity sigma, the resistance of it, let's say, is R, and thermal conductivity, assume, is also given. Now I add to it an element which is quarter of a length of the first. Seebeck coefficient is twice as big and electrical conductivity is four times smaller. Look at here, S squared sigma is exactly the same. So this second leg has exactly the same ZT as the first leg. But because it's uh, four times more resistive, I make the length four times smaller. So the actual resistance of a smaller element is the same as a bigger element. And if you want, you can add a third uh, leg, which is one ninth of the length, three times as much C back, and one ninth of the electrical conductivity. So this, based on Bergman's, Z effective of the whole should be the same as um, Z effective of a single leg. We should not get any improvement. By just uh, doing the ba uh, energy balance for the leg, actually beyond uh, derived this equation, the, uh, he found that delta T max is the same parameter we found before, is one half ZTC square, but then you need to add uh, sigma uh, for, uh, one over N square and N being these legs. So what basically tells you is that maximum cooling can increase by 33 to 78% for multi-section elements without changing ZT. At the, big, at the first sight, you will say, well, this violates um, what we saw for the Bergman's theorem for composite. But really, Bergman only said Z effective uh, cannot be higher. Whenever you have an energy conversion system, what happens when the system is inhomogeneous, like what is shown here, is that instead of having a joule heating uniformly everywhere and Seebeck only at the edges, we were able to also create Seebeck changes inside and also alter the local joule heating Heating. Nothing tells you that the balance of this should be the same as a uniform system, and that's why we can benefit. So really, um, the answer um, kind of to the puzzle is that uh, uh, Z effective in a device um, uh, 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 has only made sense if the locations of heating and cooling and everything um, um, uh, with respect to heat sinks doesn't uh, uh, matter. But in a real device, it matters and you can benefit. This was a, a toy example. Um, and how he uh, kind of came out with a length of one fourth, one ninth, and this, it was just a simple intuition. You know, that sometimes it's good to uh, not to know that theorems exist and just play with um, simple ideas. Later on, uh, Beyond looked at it and said, if I do a, a continuously graded material, but assume S square sigma is constant, but it changes with distance, what is the delta T max? He actually proved that it always can be more than one half ZT square and is given by these integrals of um, Seebeck coefficient along the length of the device, an interesting kind of averaging of the Seebeck. Um, what was even more interesting is that if uh, Seebeck is increases uh, monotonically with uh, distance, delta T max beats uniform material. 
they were able actually to find an analytical solution that maximizes this because this is valid for any Seebeck increasing with distance. And surprising thing about analytical solution is that Seebeck versus distance should follow three segments. A first segment between cold and um, halfway through the device, uh, Seebeck is constant as zero. Then you have the next segment, which is um, halfway to near the end of the device, which is here. And this seg segment, Seebeck should follow this um, rule. And the highest value SL is uh, near the hot side. And that's what is happening here. So again, in all of these, S squared sigma is constant. So again, we are not changing ZT. But what uh, Beyond uh, and others show that uh, this optimum Seebeck profile give you the highest cooling and that can um, uh, be uh, the uniform material. Why there is this curious shape of the Seebeck is not actually at all obvious. Uh, and this is analytical, you get it by the math, but what is the intuition? One of the intuition they came out is what is called uniform efficiency criteria, is that as you move through the material, instead of considering thermoelectric material as a whole, as an energy conversion, you can look at energy convention locally. And this uniform efficiency criteria tell you that with this type of profile, the efficiency of the cooling become, uh, is uniform locally. And because as t um, you cool the device, one side becomes cooler than the others, that's why there is trade-offs between Seebeck and electrical conductivity. These are all kind of toy examples because they assume S squared sigma is constant, ZT is small. It's good to find analytical solution, but you know, a, a typical um, uh, uh, complaint would be, but how does it apply in a real material where material properties are not necessarily give you Seebeck coefficients, time electrical conductivity constant, and temperature dependencies, and so on. Later on, um, uh, Bian and colleagues look at a realistic bismuthaluride material. They took at bismuthaluride Peltier coolers that are commercially existing, and they look at their uh, how you can change the doping to change Seebeck versus electrical conductivity. People knew how to do that. And then they calculated through an iterative method what will be um, temperature profile going from the cold to the hot side if you maximize local ZT. So at 240 um, uh, degree at the cold side, uh, ZT is about, uh, in this case, 0.75. And as you go from 240 uh, to room temperature on the hot side, the ZT is, uh, changes slightly between 0.72 and 0.78, but it's relatively high value everywhere. So you see the maximum cooling is about 60 degrees in this case. Now, what they did is that using this iterative uh, solution, they tried to optimize uh, this trade of the Seebeck and Peltier and see what happens in this uh, type of graph. And this is the results that they found. They found is um, you can reduce the cooling from 240 to 210 by making part of the device that is near the hot side actually worse ZT. You see the ZT number at that location is 0.1 point um, uh, to, uh, sorry, 0.4 to 0.6. Uh, um, so uh, basically you are reducing ZT by almost a factor of two. How you did it is by uh, basically making the material more resistive but a high Seebeck coefficient. Uh, why intuitively this is a good idea is that uh, here you have a more resistance, you have more joule heating, but it's actually close to the heat sink. You can get rid of it. But the pumping that you can get through the Peltier makes the temperature to be actually more uniform, and that's why you get significantly more cooling. The end result is um, uh, 30 degrees uh, more cooling, just keeping the ZT um, on the hot side to be worse than what would be if you maximize it in the first case by trading off higher Seebeck with lower resistance. So these are examples that while ZT is a good parameter as a first order understanding of a 
uh, how a system energy conversion system develops. Optimizing local ZT for the highest value does not necessarily optimum, for example, for maximum cooling. We spent quite a bit of time to see if we can generalize this for power generation. So power generation, the difference is that now you have a heat source and you have a heat sink and you want to generate voltage. And the idea, and sometimes temperature differences between hot and cold could be thousands of degrees. So there is huge potential to grade the thermoelectric elements. Uh, our intuition from coolers was that maybe there are ways we should make the ZT lower at certain value locations and still get higher efficiency. It turns out actually for power generation, there is not much you could do. Um, we learned that for power generation, optimizing material at each location to have the highest ZT is the best. Um, is not as exciting, but I, on the other hand, you know, is, when you didn't find a better combination that doesn't say that such a combination doesn't exist, maybe somebody is a smarter, could think about some of the ideas presented earlier and improve the power conversion efficiency. Uh, but one thing to remember is while you try, for example, if you go from room temperature to high temperature, at near room temperature you use bismutelluride, in the mid temperature range you use lead telluride, and the highest temperature range you use silicon germanium, you have optimized ZT over wide temperature range, uh, but one has to be careful the same current flows through the leg, and if the optimum current for the different legs is not the same, you don't benefit, and this is something that was uh, beautifully demonstrated by Jeff Snyder, but what is called compatibility factor. Uh, so this paper came out uh, in 2003 and basically this compatibility factor which is a material property tell you in the multi-segment um, elements that you need to match uh, not only the highest ZT but also the currents. Um, but of course if you can play with the geometry different segments could have different cross sections. Um, for cascaded you, uh, then the compatibility uh, problem doesn't happen because you can adjust the current as needed. What we will do next um, is look at uh, thermoelectric power conversion efficiency more fundamentally, uh, its relation to Carnot limit and other type of thermodynamic limits.